Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai, India. Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to discuss normal puerperium, a topic commonly asked in the undergraduate and postgraduate examinations. In the first part I will discuss the physiological aspects of normal puerperium and in the second part I will talk about the clinical management of a normal purpera. I will also make a separate video on puerperal sepsis later. Puerperium is a period following childbirth during which the body tissues especially the pelvic organs revert to their pre-pregnancy state. The body undergoes major anatomical and physiological changes in terms of hemodynamics, genitourinary recovery, metabolism and emotional status. Involution is a process whereby the reproductive organs return to their pre-pregnancy state and the woman is referred to as a purpera. The process is rapid initially and then gradual. Purpurium extends from the expulsion of the placenta up to 6 weeks. However, there is a recent evidence to suggest that purpural period lasts for 8 to 12 weeks. Thus, it is now a truly fourth trimester of pregnancy. The postpartum period has the following distinct but continuous phases. Immediate phase involves the first 24 hours postpartum. It is a time of rapid change with a potential for immediate crisis such as postpartum hemorrhage, uterine inversion, amniotic fluid embolism and eclampsia. It is also referred to as the acute postpartum period. The phase of up to first 7 days following delivery is called as the early or the lying in period. The remote phase lasts from end of 7 days up to 8 to 12 weeks. During this phase, the body undergoes major changes in terms of hemodynamics, genitourinary recovery, metabolism and emotional status. Next, I will discuss the physiological changes that occur in the genital tract. Immediately after delivery, the uterus becomes hard, globular with a consistency of a cricket ball and size of 20 by 12 by 7.5 cm and weighs approximately 1000 grams. By the end of the first week, it weighs 500 grams and by 6 to 8 weeks, it reverts to its non-pregnant weight of 60 grams and a volume of 5 to 10 ml. The lower uterine segment a thin flabby collapsed structure becomes normal by 6 weeks. Involution is brought about by 1. Decrease in the size and the number of muscle fibers 2. Deposition of fibrous tissue in some places and 3. Blood vessels undergo thrombosis and later hyaline degeneration. Regeneration of the endometrium starts by the 10th day and the entire endometrium is restored by 3 weeks except at the placental site where it takes up to 6 weeks. Resumption of menses after delivery is highly variable. If the woman does not breastfeed her baby, it returns by the 6th week following delivery in about 40% and by 12th week in 80% of women. Exclusive breastfeeding delays menstruation by a few months. In lactating mothers, ovulation returns by 10 weeks and in non-lactating mothers, it can occur as early as 4 weeks after delivery. Now I will talk about the changes in the cervix and vagina. The external os of the cervix, which admits two fingers, closes down by the end of the first week. Contour of the cervix is regained in 6 weeks. Complete involution of cervix and vagina takes about 4 to 8 weeks. Remember, involution of cervix and vagina is never complete with telltale signs persisting such as patulous external os, lax vaginal mucosa and few healed lacerations. 
vaginal rugosity reappears partially after 3 weeks but the vagina never regains its tone to its virginal state the external genitalia that is the vulva and the introitus also appear different after delivery the introitus remains permanently larger than in its virginal state as a result of ruptured elastic fibers in the skin and prolonged distension caused by the pregnant uterus the abdominal wall remains soft and flaccid the rectus abdominal muscles remain separated and this is called diastasis recti which if present the midline of the abdominal wall will be slightly indented abdominal wall and its ligaments require about 6 weeks time to return to their formal state one more thing vaginal delivery can also cause damage to the pelvic floor muscles and ligaments of the pelvis the return of their tone to normal may not occur to full extent and it may require pelvic floor exercises for more details please refer to my textbooks modern obstetrics and modern gynecology I will briefly talk about the general physiological changes. The pulse comes down to normal by second postpartum day. The temperature remains normal but may show a slight rise on the postpartum day 3 or 4 because of formation of milk and is therefore known as milk fever. Pronounced diuresis occurs on postpartum day 2 and 3. As a result of pain caused by episiotomy patient may have urinary retention patient may also have constipation because of decreased motility as expected the woman loses about 5 to 6 kg of weight after delivery and this is mainly because of the expulsion of the fetus placenta liquor and loss of blood volume the weight loss is 2 kg in the early postpartum period which is due to diuresis the wc count may increase up to 30000 per cubic millimeter and the predominant increase is in the granular sites for more details please refer to my textbook modern obstetrics reversal of the profound changes in the cardiovascular system that occurred in pregnancy takes over 2 to 3 weeks the cardiac output increases by about 13% in the immediate postpartum period due to increased venous return it persists for about 7 days and over another week it returns to normal the one third increase in the blood volume disappears by postpartum day 3 one of the most significant change in the preparation that is not given enough emphasis in textbooks according to me is the increase in the blood coagulation activity that occurs after delivery in puerperium everything is restored to normal but one thing that increases instead of decreasing is blood coagulation the next three diagrams will illustrate what happens to the balance between coagulation and anticoagulation activity that exists in our body in the non pregnant state there is a fine balance between pro and anti coagulation activity in pregnancy this balance tilts in favor of pro coagulation activity which is very much increased in puerperium this hyper coagulability increases further by 10 to 20 times in the first 2 weeks hence the risk of penis thromboembolism is greatly increased in puerperium especially in the first 10 days the balance between procoagulant and anticoagulant activity is restored in approximately 6 to 8 weeks here i would like to point out that there are some studies that show that coagulation factors remain elevated for up to 8 to 12 weeks postpartum In women who breastfeed, prolactin levels 
remain elevated into the sixth week after birth. Prolactin levels decline in non-lactating women, reaching the pre-pregnant range by the third week. To know more about other endocrine changes and changes in the skin, please refer to my textbook, Modern Obstetrics. Lastly, I will touch upon lactation physiology in brief because it is a separate topic deserving its own YouTube video. Lactation physiology can be considered under four phases. Mammogenesis, which is the preparation of breast for future lactation which occurs during pregnancy. Lactogenesis, which is synthesis and secretion of milk in the alveoli. Galactokinesis, which is the ejection of milk and galactopoiesis, which is maintenance of milk secretion and ejection. There is secretion of superfood colostrum for the first two to three days. On the third postpartum day, the patient's breasts become full and tense and tender as milk forms within the breast ducts. Breasts appear engorged. Then the nipple secretion changes from clear colostrum to bluish white. Suckling by the infant establishes the milk ejection reflex as shown in the figure here. For more details on lactation physiology and nursing in puerperium, please refer to my book Modern Obstetrics. This is the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on normal puerperium. Please watch part 2 in which I will discuss the clinical aspects of puerperium. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology Questions and Answers and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here. Don't forget to subscribe to my new channel called Modern OBGYN.